Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Good morning. It's uh, James Connolly for Sustainable Dish podcast. Um, I uh, w- had the opportunity to, to pick up a book. Uh, actually, just randomly found it. Um, it just been released, and uh, it uh, I've actually passed it on to a number of of uh, of farmers and friends and anybody I can kind of get my hands on to kind of talk about this. Um, and I reached out to Dan Egan, who is on the podcast today to kind of talk about it, but I want to give the name and, and the title of the book. Uh, it's called The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and a World Out of Balance. Um, and I, I got a chance to actually uh, listen to and, and partially read uh, his, his book, The Death and the Life of the Great Lakes, uh, prior to that. Um, and I think that this is, uh, Dan is really bringing a, a huge amount of sort of his exploratory power uh, to understanding some of the aspects that is, that is the modern agricultural movement today, uh, the way that we produce food um, and the levels to which we have sort of terraformed the planet uh, in order to feed ourselves. Um, and I think that all of that uh, sort of feels like a, um, a Faustian bargain uh, the 20th century sort of feels like a Faustian bargain in a way. Uh, we were able to utilize enormous amounts of uh, optimism towards sort of feeding the world, um, and uh, but sort of recognizing that some of that optimism really never looked at the long-term cost of a lot of that stuff. Um, so I wanted to welcome Dan on. Uh, this is an incredible book. Uh, it is one of those books that I actually really, really love to read because it will sort of float in into the microscopic and macroscopic world uh, to kind of give a global perspective, but then individual sort of stories uh, and everything like that. And I kind of want to prompt you with a quote from Isaac Asimov uh, that is in the book. Uh, it, said, it says, um, phosphorus is the elemental link that completes the circle of life. Literally nothing else can do its job. Uh, here's Asimov's quote. We may be able to substitute nuclear power for coal and plastic for wood and yeast for meat and friendliness for isolation, but phosphorus, there is neither substitute nor replacement. Uh, and Isaac Asimov wrote this in 1959. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I kind of want to start like, um, I, I think one of the things that I found really interesting about this um, was uh, there are, um, <laughs> again, I have, I have a problem starting this because I think it, there are so many sort of elements to this that are, are really interesting. Um, but I want to kind of, t- maybe we can go into a little bit of uh, uh, Liebig's history, uh, kind of talk about the origin of uh, NPK fertilizers from the phosphorus perspective. Uh, and then kind of talk about how much of that stuff has has influenced the way that we farm in the 20th century, if that's a starting point. Sure. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You want me to start just talking about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, you know, I'm really coming at this, this whole issue, just to say at the outset, from from a water perspective that's that's how i got interested in it that's what i've been doing for the last 25 years i've been a journalist focusing on uh covering the great lakes and i I got really interested in phosphorus when i wrote a book about the great lakes and i concentrated on what was happening on lake erie at that time they were having horrible algae blooms and it was driven by phosphorus largely driven by uh agriculture runoff. So that's, that's my entree into this whole issue. And I didn't, I don't have a great expertise in you know, the modern food production system or agriculture in general, although I did grow up across from a couple of farms uh, up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, when I was a kid. Um, 
but yeah, I got really interested from the agricultural perspective when I started reading accounts of what the links that the British were going to, I mean, really all of Europe, all of humanity, but Britain in particular, back in the early 1800s, it was still the mini ice age and famine was ever present or always a threat. And, you know, it's an island nation with limited crops and, you know, limited places for people to go. So the British were pretty desperate to keep their crops, their soils productive. And so they would tinker with anything that they could find to give, you know, their turnips and wheat a boost. And, you know, since we started agriculture 10,000 years ago, humans, I think, have intuited that soil needs to be replenished. It can't just forever. Well, they didn't intuit it. They just learned it. You know? But I think they, they realized that something, something had to go back into the soil to, to keep it productive. And so they were working with things like human waste, obviously animal waste, blood, hair, bone shavings. And that, that was really interesting. The idea that um, bones, because we have so much phosphorus in our bodies, bones are a very rich source of phosphorus. I don't think at the time they knew it was phosphorus. They just knew that mm -hmm. bones made things grow. But there's only, they, they were using at the outset, like shavings from knife factories where the handles were made of, of bones, but there weren't a lot of those around. Um, so they went on the hunt for bones elsewhere. And, you know, that took them and it took me ultimately to Waterloo, where, you know, the British plundered that battlefield five or six years after some 40,000 people fell in about 10 hours and a bunch of horses. And they came back five or six years after the war and, and stripped all the bones from the battlefield and built special mills to crush those bones and turn them into dust, pulverize them and spread them across the countryside. One of the things I struggled with was when, at what point did they realize, ah, it's not just bones, it's the phosphorus in bones, like chemically. And you were talking about Justice von Liebeg. And he was, he was a pioneer in this. But where that actual jump was made was very difficult. And you know, I think there, there may have been a number of places where it happened. Uh, the line that I, the narrative, the arc that I followed was really when um, paleontologists in the 19 or in the 18 aughts, early 18th or 19th century, um, they, they were finding specimens along the uh, English Channel so intact that um, I think it's an ichthyosaur. It's kind of like a giant alligator slash dolphin who's air breathing. Um, they, found, they found some specimens so intact that they actually had fossilized poop where their fossilized digestive tract was. And Liebig was on an excursion. And forgive me, I'm not going to have the dates right precisely, but I think it was in the 1820s with a paleontologist at the time, uh, Buckland, I think it's William F. Buckland. Anyway, he was, he was with a couple of scientists and they were looking at these uh, fossilized remains of dinosaurs. And they, at that point, they, they were commonly finding these little fossilized pieces of dung, which they called Bezos stones. They realized that it was, or they theorized that it was fossilized poop. And Liebig thought, well, if manure is such a productive um, uh, source of fertilizer, why wouldn't fossilized manure be, be so? So he did an analysis and he found that, yeah, it, it had the same contents, specifically phosphorus that, that manure did. And that really helped, I think, make the jump from, from bones to stones. Yeah. which is which are really what sustain our modern agriculture system today you know these deposits of sedimentary rock that was a, that was not something that they intuited back then they didn't think that they could eat rocks essentially you know, or use rocks to put food on their table uh, but they got there and they were firmly there by the middle of the 18th century and that time um you know, a lot of the a lot of the phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, the MPK, was coming from uh, these mountains of bird poop off of South America, off of Peru specifically. But those, you know, this is the story of phosphorus. They were seen as inexhaustible, starting in the 1840s, and by like the 1890s, they were played out, and that forced us to go 
rock hunting. And, and that's what we've been doing ever since. And those rocks, they're mostly sedimentary rocks, which are really, you know, just the sum total of a bunch of life that is long gone. And, you know, they just fell on the ocean floor and accreted there and, and turned into rock. And that rock was made accessible on the, on the landscape, either through ocean level sinking or through tectonic activity. However it happened, there are relatively few of these uh, rock deposits that are uh, above the waterline that are accessible and that sustain the modern agriculture system that today sustains 8 billion on our way to 9 billion people. Yeah. Um, you have a, uh, a, a passage in here that I wanted to read that I thought was really interesting. Um, it says, uh, in 1822, an author who identified himself as a living soldier wrote a piece that appeared in London's Morning Post, asserting that more than a million bushels of human bones, many of them fallen soldiers, were being imported to England annually. So many remains uh, arrived from the cotton so regularly that the special bone grinding mill had recently opened up in, in eastern England to handle the imports. It is now ascertained beyond a doubt by actual experiment upon an extensive scale that a dead soldier is more is a most valuable article of commerce. And for aught that I know, to the contrary, the good farmers of Yorkshire are in great measure indebted to the bones of their children for their daily bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a story. <laughs> You know, and the English actually had um, earned, I think there's a there's a term that's used, it's called perfidious Albion, um, that was used as sort of a derogatory thing, because I think that, that as many sort of interesting wars that happened between England and France and all of that stuff, at the end of the day, uh, the collection of bones were, uh, you take your dead French soldiers and the English would take their dead English soldiers. Uh, and the English ended up taking all of the soldiers. Um, <laughs> So they earned this nickname <laughs> to bring all of this stuff back. And I think it's really interesting because I think that that um, we are we're uh, we're just utilizing uh, geological time at this point, right? To uh, yeah. these bones, these sedimentary rocks uh, to sort of uh, mill all of this stuff. Um, there. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Liebig was was sort of interesting. I think he was. Um, uh, his original fertilizer recipe didn't really contain nitrogen at first. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to be an oversight on his part. Uh, I don't necessarily know why. Um, so his original recipe ended up being an utter failure. Um, but I think once he had ended up getting the sort of percentages right, uh, we saw an explosion in that. Um, yeah, I think he also was lacking acid, wasn't he? I mean, that's one yes. of the things that um, I can't remember the guy who got the patent. Um, from Robinson research. Uh, anyway, that, you know, he was, he was using sulfuric acid and, and that was making, because you know, the bones, the, the early bone experiments or usages were um, hit and miss. Like in some areas of England that worked miraculously in some areas it did nothing. And it turned out that was driven by the acidity of the soil, mm. which Laws, I think he's, John Laws is the guy who, patented this. There was a guy in Ireland who did the same thing at the same time. And uh, I think laws ended up buying him out or something. But yeah, that was 1840 when they, you know, that really is the dawn of the chemical fertilizer age. Yeah. Um, and, and I do kind of want you to go a little bit into some of the aspects of um, the, uh, the, um, the mining of this Peruvian guano, um, because I think that is, it's, it, it's sort of, uh, the, the degree of frenzy that kind of happened around that, um, that when we started to see uh, the levels to which we, I mean, we really thought this, we had a hundred, at least a couple hundred years of, of uh, uh, concormer and guano and, and uh, you know, all of this for, uh, fecundity and fertility. Uh, we thought we, we, we had hundreds of years of it and within a decade, it was mostly gone. Um, a lot of the 19th century sort of uh, movement into sort of novel forms of slavery to get people to to um, uh, to mine that, um, but then also the the sheer frenzy associated with finding uh, 
um, more farmland and uh, population, uh, the population explosions that were kind of happening at the end of the 19th century kind of created a lot of the movement that ended up becoming part of the neo-colonial sort of scramble for Africa, the scramble for um, the uncommon desert and all of that stuff. Um, because I, I think that a lot of that uh, leads into the sort of uh, our understanding of how the early 20th century ended up becoming um, such a frenzy for these NPK fertilizers. And I, I don't necessarily need you to go through the whole history because <laughs> it's a it's pretty trying, but I, I think it's an interesting story. Yeah, I think it was uh, Humboldt on his grand excursion in the early 1800s. Uh, he was he was. He um, was exploring South America and his trip took him up the West Coast to South America along the Humboldt Current, which is what it's known as now. And that was really a nutrient-rich nutrient upwelling of water from way down south that fish obviously followed. And where there were fish, there were birds and those birds needed to nest and to poop. And so they did it on this cluster of islands off of, they did it in a lot of places, but it was very concentrated in this cluster of islands off of, uh, off of, I believe it was Pisco, Peru. And, um, and so when Humboldt was on his excursion, they could smell them from the accounts that I remember reading. They could smell the islands. And, you know, there was, a, it was, it turns out this bird poop in some cases has almost the same NPK ratio as a bag of modern fertilizer. So it was just, it was the perfect, the perfect uh, crop nutrient. And he was told as much by the locals and so he, he brought a batch back, much to the consternation of his crew, because I guess it really stunk, and brought it back to Europe and had it analyzed and realized that, you know, it had these essential nutrients in it. And, um, and that set off basically a, a guano rush. And I think the Peruvians were reluctant to sell their bounty because that stuff had been tended to, you know, since antiquity. There was accounts that, you know, Disturbing the islands in certain ways was was punishable by death because they saw those islands as life, which they were. What's interesting about and, and so they harvested it in a sustainable way. And, and what's you know so you wonder why why all this bird poop on these islands and it's largely driven by climate. It just doesn't rain there. So what would normally wash into the sea and re-enter the circle of life kind of got pulled out of circulation. And, you know, I remember one time I was thinking of this in my head, I don't think it made its way into the book, but these islands were just like giant phosphorus batteries, <laughs> you know, mm. they just, it was, it was found in a concentration that you weren't finding anywhere else, but it wasn't inexhaustible, even though you, I guess when you're dealing with poop, you think you have more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly did. And yeah, there were accounts saying, yeah, we got, we can go. 200 years ahead and, and we'll still be utilizing these islands. And that was in the 1840s or 50s. And yeah, by the 1890s, it was pretty much gone, you know, and, um, and spread across Europe and, and North America. And that sent us on the hunt for, for new sources. Yeah, and we start to get into uh, Haber-Bosch, uh, pulling nitrogen from the air. Uh, we start to move into some of the aspects of um, even just the mine phosphorus that you tell. I, I wonder if you can tell uh, just a little bit. I, I just think this story is just so, um, it, it just leapfrogs across the entire spectrum. Uh, the sort of Hamburg story, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of the aspects of uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, um, trying to sort of make gold out of base materials uh mm -hmm. the original sort of uh, you know pulling of phosphorus from uh from urine but then also kind of move it forward into the utilization of phosphorus as a weapon because i think that 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 to me was something i actually found really interesting because i read a lot about the firebombing of tokyo and I had read a lot about the firebombing of Dresden, but mm -hmm. I don't think I had ever really thought about the materials that were used. Um, and elemental phosphorus and white phosphorus it seemed to be, uh, one of the things that I always find kind of amazing when I think about this stuff is how we take stuff that is so integral to life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> turn it into something um, and yeah. warp it. Uh, 
Yeah, well, that, you know, I was mentioning earlier that I was doing research on Lake Erie when I got interested in phosphorus, and I specifically got interested when I was reading the account of the first guy to discover elemental phosphorus. And so the nomenclature for the, just to back up a second, the nomenclature in the book, it was a little tricky because, you know, there's phosphates, which is really how, you know, we mostly encounter this stuff, which is phosphorus atoms surrounded by oxygen atoms. And then there's just phosphorus, and that doesn't exist in the natural world any more than a styrofoam cup would. It's got to, you've got to cleave these oxygen atoms away, and it's not done easily. And so I was reading about this guy in the 1600s in Hamburg, Germany. He was an alchemist chasing after the philosopher's stone, which was like this mythical substance that people believed could transmute base metals like lead into gold. And the thought at the time was that... Um, metals were just were just evolving toward a state of gold and silver and you know they were they were they were always on the move becoming something more valuable but it was happening geologically slow I and mean, even if they didn't put it in those terms but the idea was if we could find the substance that's making this transformation occur we could speed it along and we could get rich and so this a lot of people thought it could be divined from all manner of substances and this guy was a urine man his name was uh, Hennig Brand, and uh, he he thought he could find the magical, mythical philosopher's stone in the human waste stream, and so he did a lot of hocus pocus with a lot of urine, and ultimately, sometime in 1669, I believe, he was able to distill or precipitate out. I don't even know what the actual chemical transformation would be characterized as, but he he got from urine elemental, these little nuggets of elemental phosphorus, which didn't really do much except for glow in the dark until they got warm, until they got to about 80 Fahrenheit, and then they would just explode. And so this stuff was really nothing more than a curiosity for, let's see, 1669 to seven, for more than a hundred years, you know, it was just thought the phosphorus was just this novel stuff. Well, they, they tried to use it in, medicine and they you know it was pitched as everything that could cure everything from you know diabetes to impotence to you name it and they, they they gave it to people and it's it's poisonous but they were giving it to them at very very low doses but it wasn't curing anybody but it did have that that knack for for combusting and that ultimately uh put us on the path to weaponizing it and yeah for purposes of the book Hamburg, I really hung a lot on Hamburg because it was discovered there, phosphorus mm -hmm. in 1669. And then in 1943, once the British or once the Americans really got their planes across, built and across the ocean, it was time for the Allies to, uh, you know, fight back, I guess. And the, the Nazis had been bombing the heck out of England, you know, for, for a long time. And, um, the British were mad. <laughs> I mean, they were they were literally mad. The Americans were queasy about bombing cities. They they were, you know, okay with bombing the industries. And the thoughts at the time, I mean, it makes sense. It's like, look, if we can we can save a lot of lives if we can take out a nation's ability to to wage war. If we can take out the factories, like ball bearing factories, mm -hmm. submarine factories. And if we can go to the root of the stuff that is doing all the killing, we can we can kill that. And, and save save people in the long run. But there was an element of revenge in there too, and especially because the English had suffered so mightily under these Nazi attacks. So they they decided to um, burn, a, burn a city to the ground and they did a lot of research with architects. They actually had architects from Germany who were working with the British, helping them because they started realizing that you can't blow a city to smithereens with traditional bombs. Um, it's much more effective to try to burn them down. So they, they developed these incendiary bombs. And the idea was you just start a ton of little fires until they merge into one super giant fire tornado, which is exactly what happened. And then that can raise a town. And so for over six or seven nights in July and maybe early August, well, in the summer of 1943, I think they were all night raids. No, no. I think the Americans bombed during the day and the British bombed at night. I'm going from memory here. Because the British were indiscriminate about where they were going to drop. They didn't care if they were dropping it on neighborhoods because they'd been dropped on. Mm 
Uh, there's a great quote in the book from Arthur Bomber Harris, the head of the RAF, I believe, just saying that, you know, basically the Germans started this and um, they naively thought they could bomb everybody and no one would bomb them back. Well, they're about to get theirs. And even Franklin Roosevelt, I saw an address to uh, Congress that he did, and you know he had this kind of wicked grins, like yeah, they're about the Germany's about to get what's their due, and so the Americans would bomb during the day. There was uh, there was a submarine plant not too far from there, from from Hamburg on the island of Usedom, and no, 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 there there was a submarine factory installments and factories, I believe, right in Hamburg, and but just north up on the Baltic coast, there was the um, island of Usedom, which they were building V1 and V2 rockets which you know, could have really changed the trajectory of the war had that been more successful. So anyway, um, the Allies just bombed and bombed and bombed and bombed Hamburg, similar to what they did to Dresden, but but before that. And uh, I think it was at the time, it had to have been like the largest aerial attack ever. And mm-hmm. and they they accomplished what they set out to do. They, they, they burned what could burn in that city to the ground and they killed tens of thousands of people. Um, and a lot of those bombs, they, they, they were, you know, they relied heavily. They dropped big, I think they called them, they're 500 pound bunker busters. No, that's what we call them today. They were called, mm-hmm. anyway, they dropped big bombs, but only to, to blow out roofs and, and windows to, so, so fires could convect through a structure. So it was never intended to just blow the city up. It was to burn it down. And, and so they did that and it was largely with these incendiary bombs, some of them were magnesium and some of them were phosphorus, which you know was quite a coincidence considering that's where phosphorus was first discovered. And, and so that, that got me intrigued about going to Hamburg, but even m- more intriguing is this fact that these bombs, these phosphorus bombs, when they explode, they'll burn through anything that they hit, whether that's a building or a person. I mean, they, they, these globules, they look like fireworks. They look exactly like fireworks. When they mm-hmm. explode, there's just this glowing glob and then this trail of smoke behind it. And that glowing glob was, you know, was, was the devil's element, was, was white phosphorus. Um, and it would burn whatever it hit, unless it hit water. And then it would stabilize. And, and today, there are, you know, the riverbank, the Elbe that cuts through the middle of Hamburg and like the Baltic coast up by Usedom. There, there are signs saying, you know, be careful. So a lot of people up there are looking for phosphor or looking for amber because that mm-hmm. whole area used to be a conifer forest, you know, millions and millions of years ago. And that generated a lot of resin, which, which created these caches of, it's, it's called Baltic amber it's like a product kind of like you know wild alaskan salmon <laughs> and uh, so so amateurs are out there hunting for it and these i'll call them frozen little pebbles of uh of phosphorus look a lot like amber in some cases almost exactly like it so people will pick these little nuggets up from the riverbank or from the baltic sea coast and put them in their pocket and think that they found something you know of value great treasure and then um if they happen to, you know, heat that stuff up in their pocket, which is not uncommon to 80 degrees or more, then it combusts. And so I, I encountered, I, in the book, I think I only have one person, but but it, it doesn't happen every day, but it happens often enough that there are signs along the beaches saying, you know, look out for phosphorus. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so today people are still being burned by the stuff. And as long as we're talking about Hamburg, it comes full circle, which is really what this book's about. It's the circle of life in my mind. But another circle within that circle is is the story of phosphorus in Hamburg. So it was discovered there, and then the city was burned to the ground. Oh, I mean, almost. There's a lot of stone that didn't burn. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they really did bomb the heck out of it. And then today, Germany's got a super strict uh, phosphorus emission uh, law coming on the books at the end of the decade in 2029, I believe, where basically all the phosphorus in the human waste stream, because there's a lot of phosphorus in our urine and feces, uh, needs to to be pulled out before it's uh, before that treated water is discharged back into area waters around Hamburg, and so they've built this state-of-the-art phosphorus recovery plant. So, 
So I, I definitely knew I needed to go to, to Hamburg to, to write the story. And so um, luckily I made this trip in December of 2019. Otherwise the book wouldn't be done right now because once COVID travel restrictions came on, it really kind of froze me up. But yeah, and so there's, but the, you know, there's the, the story of elemental phosphorus and the story of phosphates as fertilizer and they're intertwined. I mean, to, to, to find out where they, where they actually, you know, come together is difficult, but, but people eventually realize that phosphorus along with nitrogen and potassium is essential to, to soils to keep them productive. And the real hunt for phosphorus, I think the real pressure, I don't think it would have been so great had we not um, had uh, Fritz Haber and, and Bosch not develop that process for pulling nitrogen out of uh, air, because air is, what, 80%, 78% yeah. nitrogen. Yeah. And they figured out in, I think it was 1909, uh, a process where they could they could basically the German the literal phrase is bread from air because uh, they, they were they were always hungry for for uh, nitrogen at the same time they were hungry for phosphorus we talked about Liebig earlier he's the guy who pioneered or if not pioneered popularized the whole concept of the law of the minimum and so back in the 1800s the you know it could be nitrogen a field could be nitrogen limited or phosphorus limited. I don't think potassium was ever really that that uh, rare, but but the other two were. And once we uncapped the source of nitrogen, then phosphorus had to keep up. And so that's what we've been doing ever since is is trying to match our phosphorus production with our nitrogen product production. And it's a game you can't win in the end because there's only so many finite deposits of this phosphorus on the globe, and the nitrogen is always going to be in abundance as long as we have the energy to do the, the whole process of pulling it out of the air. This podcast was made possible by my favorite electrolyte company, started by my friend and Sacred Cow co-author, Rob Wolf. Element, the all-natural sugar-free powder you just add to water, which tastes great and gives you the perfect amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium to keep you perfectly hydrated. They have a limited time new grapefruit flavor, and I've developed a recipe on my blog for the salty grapefruit limeade, and I know you'll love it. So check it out, and also take advantage of Element's free flavor sample pack with your purchase. So just visit sustainabledish.com backslash LMNT to place your order. Remember, just drinking plain water could actually leave you more dehydrated, which is why you need to replenish your electrolytes. Element is absolutely the best tasting and cleanest option out there, and I drink it daily. So go to sustainabledish.com backslash LMNT to claim your free gift, and thanks. Yeah. Can we, um, yeah, you have a, um, a, a metaphor that's talked about when they talk about the law of the metaphors that I thought was really interesting. It's the sort of barrel story. Um, because I, I do think that that um, if you're if you're talking about human health, uh, the way that amino acids work in the body is actually fairly similar as well. Uh, the law of the mem- minimum uh, is required in order for you to be able to synthesize the proteins you need to survive. Um, mm-hmm. But the way that we grow food is also based on that. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, some of the aspects of that because I found that really interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, that's really a common analogy that professors use. I, I found it all over the internet. But when you're trying to explain the law of the minimum, you know, a, a good way to do it is to look at a, a wooden barrel. And, you know, each plank in that barrel, I think, is called a stave. And, and then they're held together by, you know, steel straps at the bottoms and in the middle. And they say, now imagine you know, a barrel where one of these staves, one of these planks is, isn't high enough to go to the top. Well, that's going to, that's going to govern how much water you can put in that barrel. You know, it can only go as high as the, you know, it's kind of like a chain's only as strong as its weakest link. The barrel's only going to fill to its shortest stave. Mm -hmm. And so that's true uh, with agriculture, as you were just pointing out. And so, yeah, so many crops we're phosphorus limited. It's like, if you can just get more phosphorus, everything else is in place, particularly after Haber-Bosch and we had all the nitrogen we could handle. Um, 
it's it's all it's all governed by phosphorus for good and ill. I mean, it, it, right. it, that works on a crop, but it also works in our waters in terms yeah. of killing algae that we don't want. And that's that's a great transition. So I wonder if we can kind of talk a little bit about that. Like, let's start to move into the modern agricultural movement. Uh, specifically, like, let's talk about um, Florida, uh, Bone Valley, um, where the percentage of, of phosphorus that is coming from there. Uh, that we use in our fertilizers, and then maybe talk about Morocco, uh, Western uh, Western Africa, um, and some of the aspects of that. Because I, I do think that the, the the finity of having these abundant sites um, is is actually in some ways kind of scary to me. Um, and you kind of go back and forth between the percentages of what we have left and um, resources versus you know, uh, any number of different things. But I think it's really interesting um, to transition to what we have now and then the leaching that kind of happens um, because of the way that we um, uh, sort of outlay this stuff to our agricultural fields. Um, yeah, sure. I don't know so where you want to start with that, but I think it's... Well, yeah, so so we were talking earlier about the jump from from bones to bird poop to stones and in Florida. So the first phosphorus deposits in phosphorus, I'm just going to keep calling it phosphorus, even though it is phosphates, but right. just to, to keep it clean. The first phosphorus deposits of significance, I believe, in South Carolina, and not long after that, they found them in Florida, which, you know, is such a low-lying spit of land that it, it's got a long history of being underwater and above water. And because of that, there's a cache of fossils in the center of the state, east of uh, Tampa. It's called Bone Valley, where you get like these terrestrial creatures lying with, you know, like mastodons in the same bed of gravel with uh, giant ancient sharks. <laughs> They're like, what the heck was, how, how can these be together? But that's a function of, of the ocean level waxing and waning. But among those fossilized remains, there's also a lot of uh, uh, pebbles that are phosphorus rich sedimentary rock. And so they don't know exactly why certain areas get this concentration of nutrient rich rocks, but it just, there's theories, but it's, it's a geological process. And it's basically, so to rewind here, the first sources of phosphorus was coming from igneous rocks. That was just, you know, what, what earth had when baby earth cooled and all, all the molten rock uh, turned hard, there was traces of phosphorus in those rocks and they leached out into the environment where eventually when life took hold, whenever, for whatever reason, um, there was, there was phosphorus floating around, which, you know, Isaac Asimov also refers to phosphorus as life's bottleneck. I, I, I can't remember if he referred mm -hmm. to that in the quote that he used, but yeah, it was a slow trickle, and that meant a slow trickle of life. And the thing about phosphorus is it doesn't go away. It's like a water drop. It can, you know, be in the sky. It can be at the bottom of Lake Superior. It can be in a glacier. It can be in, you know, some tailings pond of a mine. It, it can go all over the place, but it doesn't go away. And the same is true with phosphorus. And early in life, in Earth's history, there was so little of it because it just was, it would leach out of these rocks. But it, once it did, you know, an organism would take it up, use it, die, decay, and another organism would take it and use it up. Now, this wasn't always the case in the deep ocean, you know, with stuff falling to the bottom where it largely drops out of the circle of life. And that's where we get these rock, to, that's the original source of, of these sedimentary rocks. So there's that going on, but there's also just the stuff that's just naturally trickling in and out of the living world. You know, it's something, a simple way to look at it is like a forest. You know, how can a forest keep sprouting trees? Well, the trees die and decay and release their nutrients, and the phosphorus is what we're talking about, back into the soil to allow for the next generation, and on and on and on it goes. Well, once we figured out, you know, where to find phosphorus-rich rock, this leaching was no longer the uh, mechanism for it to make its way into the environment. We were we were soaking it in acid and, and putting it in chemical concoctions and, and spreading it on our fields. So we took the circle of life and, and broke it. And you know this isn't this isn't dumb what we did. It's it's what any organism would do. You know if you can find something that's going to make you more productive, you're going to use it. 
And so that's how we ended up with this system where uh, we're not just using it once and then using it again and again and again. We're, we're, just, we're basically just putting it on our crops. Whatever the crops take up, great. Uh, the rest of it's just going to flush into the water. And what does get taken up by a crop and ultimately finds its way into us often, you know, sewage treatment notwithstanding, makes it just gets dumped back into the water. And, and so this is kind of an esoteric concept, but, you know, people think, well, we're never going to run out. What's the worry? Well, thing is, is what we're relying on today, the, I referred to it earlier, is like a battery of phosphorus. The, these are deposits that accumulated over millions of years and, and concentrated. And then we're setting it loose back into the environment in a, diffu in a diffuse way. So it's not like we can just go back to that pile of rocks because that's where the phosphorus ends up. No, it ends up you know, in Lake Erie, which is turning green as a golf course every summer now because there's so much phosphorus in the water. And so that's one thing, but also you talked about how it leaches, how it leaches into the water. Um, we've been using so much chemical fertilizer since the early 1900s that it's not just turning the water in Lake Erie and waters across the country green. It's also accreting in the soils in a way that it's not really that biologically accessible to plants. It's, it's, it's either too deep or it's, it's locked up with, with other stuff and it's not, you know, soluble enough to really to make its way into a crop, but it's, it does do what, what those igneous rocks did. It, it slowly leaches into the environment. So that's something that's going to be going on for a long time. Um, and it's a consequence of our just, you know, aggressive use of fertilizer for the last century and a quarter. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you, uh, you say that, um, I, I want to kind of go into some of the EPA uh, Clean Water Act, um, uh, the ramifications of that, because I think that what we saw in the 50s and 60s, where we, we started to use a lot of phosphates in uh, detergents and uh, washer machines and any number of different, uh, had other industrial uses for it, um, but we started to put curbs on that, but the agricultural um, our, our agricultural system uh, wasn't really given in any way curbs on those. Um, so even today, when you try to limit the amount of fertilizers that put on the field, you still have those phosphates um, that are leaching into that system um, that will be going on for, for years to come. Um, one of the things that you kind of talk, I want you to talk about that, but the one of the things you talk about is the, the remarkable accuracy that a lot of scientists will have in predicting these um, these algae bl al algae blooms, um, they are really gotten good at predicting how bad yeah. it's going to be. Uh, and then a little bit about what is that doing to the economies that surround that. So, Bone Valley in Florida, how is that leaching into the system? How is that affecting the environment that surrounds it? Uh, you know, miles and miles downstream. But how is that affecting reverberative through the Great Lakes and a lot of the water systems that have these um, uh, uh, costs and effects that are, I think the U.S. government uh, tends to have to pay for downstream or the U.S. taxpayer has to pay for downstream. So I know that's like three things, but I think- Yeah, I'll try to keep it straight here. Um, <laughs> Sorry, and, and, and correct me. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, we, you know, our first, our first realization that phosphorus wasn't just an, you know, entirely positive substance uh, in terms of agriculture and, and other um, human uses for it beyond weapons was uh, in the 1950s and 60s when we started uh, using washing machines regularly, like, you know, across the country. And that demanded a better soap, which was uh, this chemical concoction called a detergent, which was rich with phosphorus. And it was, it was great for getting clothes clean, but not long after we started, you know, uniformly using, the, using the, that product across the country, water started turning green and there were some very interesting experiments that I won't go into. At the moment, it was determined that this was, nobody knew what was causing it, but it was mm. uh, determined to be phosphorus. So they pulled phosphorus from most detergents and the water quality got a lot better. And this was like in the early 1970s. Along the same time, we got the Clean Water Act, which not only addressed phosphorus in terms of discharges from industries and wastewater treatment plants, um, but all sorts of all sorts of pollutants coming out of 
our industrial world. Um, and, you know, that led to strict pollution controls on smokestacks and pipes. But the Clean Water Act largely left alone agriculture. So in regulatory, regulatory parlance, it's there's point source pollution, which is a pipe or a smokestack, just a physical place that is discharging a measurable amount of waste. And then there's non-point source pollution, which is just the stuff on the earth that washes off and makes its way into our water. And that's what agriculture is, I mean, and maybe more accurately was uh, in, in the early 1970s. Uh, at the time it was, it was considered, you know, not a significant enough source of phosphorus and it was too diffuse and too difficult to regulate that the Clean Water Act basically gave agriculture a pass on the water regulations that every other industry had to follow. And it, it made sense at the time. And one thing I wanna be clear is I don't wanna disper disparage or vilify uh, the agriculture industry. They're just operating under the system that's been set up. They may have influenced it at times, but it really is something that, you know, Congress has agreed to, it's, it's the game. They're playing by the rules of it, uh, but the, the game isn't working so well anymore. Um, so, yeah. I mean, but you, you talk about, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt, but you, you talk about at the time, um, sorry to lose you for a second. No. I'm oh, no. Uh, you talk about at the time, a, a large, uh, say, dairy farm or a large pig farm at the time would probably be about 100 cows. Uh, yeah, we're talking, yeah. it, right. And then so they've gotten so much bigger in the last 50 years, which, you know, they are arguably by definition now point source pollutions. I'm talking about the concentrated mm -hmm. animal feeding operations that can have yeah. a thousand head of cattle. Well, those cattle don't just make milk, they make manure and urine and they have to put it somewhere. And it first goes to these sewage or manure lagoons, which are a point source of pollution. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> If, if they aren't, I don't know what is, but they're not regulated. Well, they are regulated to a degree. You know, uh, these, these, big, these big agriculture operations, um, anything that's happening like on the actual, like where the animals are, that you've got to get permits to discharge stuff from, from those areas, water permits. But once that manure gets taken away from its lagoon, which it has to be because the lagoon's going to fill up, start sloshing over, mm -hmm it gets applied on fields. And once it goes onto a field, it bureaucratically transforms back into non-point pollution and is therefore largely unregulated. And that's having some real severe consequences for us today because as I mentioned earlier, phosphorus doesn't just make corn stalks and soybeans grow. It can make stuff that we don't want grow. And that's where we're coming. That's why we're, we're having all these problems with everything from Lake Erie to Bone Bat or uh, Central Florida, well, the coast of Florida, Lake Okeechobee yeah. is, is like overdosed with phosphorus because there's so much ag in the central part of Florida. It's not tied directly to Bone Valley, only in that, you know, a lot of these operations use fertilizer that is largely concocted from the stuff coming out of, uh, out of Bone Valley, but it gets, the, the phosphorus washes off and in the case of Florida, it, Central Florida, it ends up in this big, shallow, warm petri dish of a lake called Lake Okeechobee, where toxic algae blooms magnificently in late summer. And because the Army Corps of Engineers, which operates this lake, which is actually a fortified system of dikes, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is always afraid that these dikes are going to collapse because they have in the past. And it's a disastrous effect. There were thousands of people who died in Florida in, I think it was 1926 and 1928 two separate times that Lake Okeechobee uh, spilled over its embankment and flooded out towns. Well, now there's about 40,000 people in the, the floodways, the theoretical floodway path. So the Army Corps doesn't want the water to get too high on these man-made dikes, so they release the water. And it's not just water, it's toxic uh, algae as well. And it ends up going to the uh, Gulf Coast around Fort Myers and to the Atlantic Coast around the city of Stewart, Florida. So these, these algae outbreaks are typically, it's different from the red tide. It's called blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. It's not technically an algae, it's photosynthesizing bacteria that produces these nasty toxins. Um, the salt waters around these cities were basically thought to be immune from these kind of outbreaks that plague inland fresh waters. But now with these discharges from the freshwater, I say freshwater with a 
loosely from the freshwater lake of uh, Okeechobee, you know, they bring, they bring these toxic plumes to the coasts and people are suffering uh, financially in terms of beach closures um, and, and property values and, and also in terms of human health. People are getting sick. This stuff uh, is a uh, liver toxin and it can cause respiratory distress and, and yeah. GI issues. And there's even an emergence, emerging concern that it could be uh, uh, causing or a factor in um, higher than usual uh, incidences of, of neuro neurological diseases like ALS. I mean, there's, there's, been, there's one study in, in uh, New Hampshire where these people were living around an algae infested lake and, and they had uh, ALS levels that were way beyond anything that they would normally expect for a population that size. And there's other research going on as well, but it's, it's bad stuff. It kills dogs. It's killed like in Brazil, the toxin from this toxic algae got its way into, uh, made its way into the water system at a dialysis center and killed like 50 people. And so it is, it's not to be trifled with. So yeah, we've, we've got this problem and you know, it's, the, the question is, what's the answer? And the book that I wrote isn't prescriptive and it's not saying we need to do this, 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 and that. But I think it is pretty obvious at this point that the agriculture system we've set up isn't working in terms of protecting our water quality. And while we all need food, and I really, I mean, I am I am as dependent on the agriculture system as anybody else and I recognize that, but we also need fresh water. And, and right now in some places, and I think it's gonna become increasingly so if we stay on the same path, it's gonna be, you know, they're on a collision course, our efforts to protect water and our efforts to feed, feed humanity. And so, you know, what might be an answer? I think we're talking again about the circle of life and being smarter about how we use this manure that, you know, we're producing so much of in terms of not just putting it on a field because we need to get rid of it, but you process it so you can actually get the, you know, the exact stuff that you can get methane out of, out of manure, which we are doing. I read a story right. in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel last year about how because of some legislation in California that's incentivizing farmers to, to, to put um, uh, digesters, anaerobic digesters on their farms to process all their manure and, and strip the methane out of it. Some farmers are like approaching making as much money from their methane as they are their milk. <laughs> and it's not just methane you can get out of that. You can get, you can get nitrogen, you can get phosphorus and it could be packaged and sold as a product every bit as pure as anything that's coming from a chemical factory. The problem right now for farmers is moving that manure. Once they have to take it more than 10 miles from the barn in which it was produced, it, it becomes a real money loser and they can't compete. So nobody wants to put farmers out of business, but if you have, uh, you know, fair and, and, and well thought out regulations, it le levels the playing field. And so we may end up paying more for, for certain types of products like milk or meat. But right now, and increasingly so, we're paying in a way that we don't even ponder. Like uh, in my home state of Wisconsin, Lake Mendota on the edge of the University of Wisconsin campus is one of the most beautiful inland lakes that you'll see anywhere. And uh, it's long been, you know, a place for students. There's docks and decks for people to swim. There's, you know, a lifeguard station. But you go there in late summer today, there's no lifeguard because there's no life in the lake other than this toxic algae. And that's the consequence of dairy operators in that watershed and the lake being overdosed with phosphorus. So that's a real cost, like not being able to use one of the premier natural features of a Big Ten University campus. And it's just one lake. I mean, Wisconsin's got thousands of lakes and, you know, North America's got tens and tens of thousands of lakes and not all of them are exposed to this, but a lot of them are. And once you kind of start thinking about it, you start seeing all these stories and it's just like another beach is closed, you know, another dog died, um, you know, another another water system, you know, has, has gone out because the toxin got into the water as it did in 2014 in Toledo. This, Toxic algae basically made the water in Toledo, half a million people who lived in Toledo and in Byron's um, couldn't drink the water coming out of their taps for a number of days. And they couldn't boil it to make it safe because that only intensifies or concentrates the toxin. So you had like the National Guard delivering baby formula 
to, to, to Toledo, which is a pretty grim prospect when you think that Toledo is on the edge of the world's largest freshwater system. So there's a lot of things at play, you know, when we think about phosphorus and, and what the future could hold. But I think the most important thing is to, for people to recognize the connection between phosphorus coming off the landscape and phosphorus uh, influencing toxic algae outbreaks when it hits the waters. And then what we're growing and why. And I'll just put this out here and leave it at that. But 40% of the corn we grow today goes towards ethanol, which nobody who's studied the ethanol mandate um, very closely thinks that that is a net environmental benefit just because it takes so much energy to grow the corn to make that ethanol as well as process it. It also takes a lot of fertilizer inputs and a lot of takes puts a lot of land in production that would otherwise be performing valuable ecological services as well. So Iowa loves corn or uh, loves ethanol because you know it's big corn country. And so anybody who wants to be president of the United States basically has to go to Iowa at the beginning of the campaign because that's where the first yeah. they're at the front of the primary season with their caucuses. And they basically have to pledge allegiance to ethanol. And Al Gore admitted as much when he was running. I can't remember what year that was, 2008? Or, yeah, 2000. 2000. Anyway, he, um, he, he admits today that that was a mistake, but he had a fondness for the, uh, for the farmers of Iowa because he had presidential ambitions. And so that's the case with almost every candidate that goes through there. So that, that's, uh, that's likely changing with Democrats for different reasons, not, not phosphorus driven, but th that could help maybe move move us away from, from this, this uh, ethanol program that really is, is not satisfying anybody but the producers of the ethanol. Yeah, I think one of, one of the concerns for me is that, uh, especially when you're talking about the biodigesters, uh, is that it'll become an excuse for more CAFOs. Yeah. Um, you know, and so all the downstream, uh, even if you're talking about some of the added advantages of, um, of utilizing these things for for biogas or you know even just the fertilizer um you're just going to grow as big as you possibly can so that you can um you know continue and then all the downstream at like effects of that will kind of but <laughs> push I'm, back I'm, into the environment yeah i'm kind of agnostic <laughs> if, if we yeah. can if we can manage it like the size of the farm i mean all that meat and well i can't say that all that milk is being used otherwise we wouldn't have all that cheese stored all around the country that nobody wants <laughs> but um you know if is if these these operations are regulated or managed to the extent that they don't send you know just like you look at some of these factories and you know they're right on the banks of rivers that are filled with walleye now i mean the industry and and the environment are not mutually exclusive or tending to both um, so I think there are opportunities there, but I, I also recognize the concern because if you only go halfway regulating and then you incentivize farmers to get bigger and bigger and bigger, that's a net loser. But if you, if they're managed well, and we have a net reduction in the phosphorus discharges into our water, then it's hard to blame the size. It's just the way we run it. But I, you're, I, you're not the only one who's expressed that concern to me. Yeah, um, you. Uh, um, uh, one of the stories that you tell um, that I thought was uh, really interesting because so my first job out of high school, um, uh, eighteen to like nineteen, uh, I worked at a chemical company that we used. They used um, we would clean the hydraulic pumps for uh, waste uh, waste disposal and renewal. Um, in, in a place that was outside of New York. So we would go up and you would take all of the, you, know, you call it night soil in the book, but you would take all of the waste that was coming from New York City. Um, you'd leach the water out of it. Uh, you would uh, treat the water, contain the water, um, you start to utilize that stuff. And the trucks would come in and then take that, utilize it as fer fertilizer. Um, but you talk a lot about how cities functionally changed a lot of that stuff so that, um, especially in places like London, where the the great stink um, created the sewer system that that really just tried to excise as much of the waste as possible. Um, yeah. Do you see some of that stuff like starting to change within the way that we think about it? Um, well, yeah, I mean, in just, larger that, cities. Well, that's what that's why I went to Germany because because they are they're they're you know 
and they're doing it for two reasons. When I say doing it, I'm referring to the, uh, the wastewater discharge rules that are going to, you know, essentially ban any phosphorus discharges uh, from wastewater treatment plants. And, you know, we, we do remove a lot of it today in the United States, but there's still a lot in there. Um, so, I'm sorry, what was the... Um, oh, well, any, you, is there a change in about... method? Yeah, I yeah. think there is. And, you know, human the human waste stream is, is small compared to the agriculture waste stream, but it's important because we can manage it and um, it can also sh show us the, the way forward. And that way forward is already happening in Europe, in Germany specifically, with these state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plants that are, are stripping all... All, I mean, you can never get to zero, but basically all the phosphorus out of the waste stream. And, and they're doing it to protect their water. And they're also providing a source of uh, fertilizer because Europe doesn't have any real significant um, phosphorus rock deposits, which brings us back to something that I should have answered earlier as far as, you know, how much do we have and, and how much is left. And so... The biggest deposit that the U.S. has is still in Florida, but we're extracting it at such a pace that it's been said we could, you know, run out of it in a matter of decades, like four decades or so. Mm -hmm. And at which point there's still some deposits in North Carolina and in Idaho. I'm sure we would develop and extract those, um, but there's just not that that much of this stuff around the globe. Seventy to eighty percent of the reserves. Are believed to be in Western Sahara and Morocco. And the, the difference between reserve and resources is significant. The reserve is what's been, been mapped, identified, and deemed suitably um, harvestable in terms of economics mm -hmm. and just logistics. So once we get hungry, I'm sure that the definition of, uh, of reserve will change because, you know, if you're hungry, you're going <laughs> to, you know, you'll do whatever it takes to get it. But right now, I mean, Somebody estimated back in 2011, an Australian researcher, that the world's basically, its, it's phosphorus rock deposits would play out in, uh, you know, 70 to 80 years, which most people think is uh, very, very pessimistic. And they say, you know, we could have three to 400 years worth of this stuff left. But it's not spread uniformly across the globe. So it's like oil, you know, people are going to be, be competing for it, you know, and maybe violently. Yeah. Um, I don't know where to go from here, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think we've we've gone through a lot of the stuff that you've. I I wanted to kind of leave a little bit on the Great Lakes, um, just because I think that that is um, it's such a wonderful book. I mean, both of them. I think you're just a, a brilliant researcher and great storyteller. Um, you know. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to get into it. Maybe I can bring you on at a different time because I think that that book is just um, the uh, the enthusiasm surrounded surrounding the idea of the American Mediterranean uh, is just such an interesting yeah. aspect that I had never heard about. Um, I wonder if you could kind of like preview that just a little bit because I think it's a really interesting story and we can kind of leave it at that. Sure. Um, yeah. So so yeah. this this phosphorus book, uh, the Devil's Element. Phosphorus in a World Out of Balance came out just uh, in March, March 7th. Um, mm -hmm. But six years earlier, on March 7th, uh, my first book came out called The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. And it's basically a, a, a natural history of the lakes, really focusing on what's happened since the 1950s, which is when we opened up the lakes that were once isolated. So there's five Great Lakes, Superior, Huron, Michigan, Erie, and Ontario. And when you look at a map, you just see these big blue blobs. And a lot of people mistakenly think that they're just static bodies of water, like, you know, like little oceans. But they're really a big river. And they flow out to sea over Niagara Falls and down the St. Lawrence River and out to the ocean. So there was a connection for these lakes to flow out to the world. But because of Niagara Falls and because of the volume of water coming down the St. Lawrence River, the lakes were really isolated biologically from the outside world. They're as isolated as like a pond in the north woods of Wisconsin. But then we opened up this nautical highway called the St. Lawrence Seaway to bring in uh, vessels from around the world to try to turn ports like Milwaukee and Chicago into something that could rival anything on the ocean coasts. And so we opened this up and they, they did it by building canals and locks and channels. Just basically, um, it was a nautical highway for, for these boats. 
it opened in 1959. And unfortunately, like right when it opened, the uh, size of the average uh, US freighter was just exploding because that was at the dawn of the container age, so which container right. freighters are much bigger. So, so the system of locks, dams, channels, and canals called the St. Lawrence Seaway is really built for another era. So we get, the boats look big. I'm sitting here at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Sciences, where I'm a, a fellow. It's on the harbor in Milwaukee and I can look out and there are no boats there right now, but they're big. They're like, I mean, the ones that sail out the seaway, they're I think about 750 feet long, 80 feet wide, uh, mm -hmm. but that's small compared to modern, modern shipping. Anyway, we opened up the, the lakes to these boats and we didn't get the traffic that we hoped for, but we did get stuff that we didn't think about. And that was all the pollution, the biological pollution that these boats were bringing in. And they're, they use ballast tanks to steady their themselves. And those tanks can be filled with whatever life was teeming in the waters of their last port, which could be on the other side of the globe. So it's just radically altered the, uh, the whole ecology of the Great Lakes. You know, the bottom of the Great Lakes right now looks more like the Caspian Sea than the lakes that, uh, you know, the French and the early uh, white explorers and the Native Americans before them uh, experienced. So it's just kind of the ecological unraveling and then stitching back together of, of the Great Lakes with a lot of people in it, a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah I think that um, uh, reading these two in tandem were uh, just a really great access into the way that you were thinking about both of, both of these uh, stories. Um, well, thank you. I mean, really, thank you so much um, for uh, spending the time uh, everything that you've told me so far is uh, is so beautifully told in the book um, that uh, I really highly recommend anybody who is involved in agriculture who cares about where their food is coming from uh, and who cares uh, about the way that we've sort of moved all of these different elements around um, you know in order to sort of create our industrial age uh, the sort of like downstream ramification, literal downstream ramifications of all the problem solving that we do that creates more problems. <laughs> right. um, but thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Um, so uh, Dan, you're on Twitter, um, Daniel Patrick Egan, uh, I believe. That's Dan your Patrick Twitter Egan. At Dan, Dan Patrick Egan. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to mention the book again, The Devil's Element, Phosphorus in a World Out of Balance. Um, and uh, the book prior to that was called The uh, Death and the Life of the Great Lakes. Um, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Right. Appreciate it. Right. Um, let me just wait. Hold on. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, Please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads, and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.